Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod's Life Ministry. We're sharing the stories and insights of real people living out God's love for the people He's created. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us for episode 24. I'm your host, Steph Nugebauer. And today I am here with two people I actually get to talk to on a nearly daily basis. We have Tiffany Manor, which you have a new title now. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah. So I defended my dissertation and completed my doctoral program. So now I guess technically it's Deaconess Doctor Tiffany Manor. But I, I really think that my mom is probably going to be the only one who really uses the doctor <laughs> title because, you know, moms get to be kind of proud of their their offspring. So, so yeah, so it can, it's, she of course, should be. Friends. it's Tiffany, but, but officially, officially it's Deaconess Doctor. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations, Tiffany. I also am very proud of you. So I understand your mom would want to say all parts of your name. No. <laughs> well, I think it's kind of neat in the church that we put the uh, ecclesiastical title before that educational status title. Uh, mm-hmm. That's probably a better phrase for that than educational status. But, but you, you know, we say reverend doctor and we say deaconess doctor and it focuses on, on our vocation serving Christ. So I, that I think is, is kind of neat. Maybe helps keep us humble too and, and not get too distracted by, by titles. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, congratulations. What an accomplishment. So we have today Deaconess Dr. Tiffany Manor, so Tiffany, and then the Mrs. Chris Freeman along. Now, you've heard Tiffany here before. In fact, you hear her every episode because she's on the beginning before I come in and at the end of each episode. But I also try to rope her into co-hosting as often as her schedule allows. But Chris, she'll be a new voice to you. And so I will allow her to introduce herself to you now. Well, thanks, Steph. I am Chris Freeman, Manager of Life Ministry, and I just joined Life Ministry before Christmas. And before that, I served almost five years in the school ministry office here as part of the Office of National Mission. Before that, I was a teacher. I was born and raised in Baltimore and Uh, Out of college, I began teaching at Baltimore Lutheran School, which is now Concordia Prep School. I taught Spanish and French to high school students. I also taught part-time at Towson University, and I uh, was a part-time instructor through Genesis Virtual Academy, which is out of Mayor Lutheran High School. And then about five and a half years ago, my husband accepted a call here to the Missouri District, And that was the first big move for me as an adult at age 45. And so here I am. Al and I are empty nesters now because we have two college-aged students. The kids have gone to uh, Lutheran schools from preschool through 12th grade. And now they are at the University of Arkansas. So they're close to me. Yes, they are in Fayetteville. Samuel is a freshman. He's 18. Holly is a sophomore. She is 20. And Holly is living the dream because she is now in the college program at Disney World. So I get lots of pictures of the pool and pictures of fireworks. <laughs> and um, she tells me every day how much her feet hurt. And we say boohoo. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel all that bad for you. That is awesome. My three-year-old daughter, Nora, would love to be Holly. That is her thing. (laughs) Castles, fireworks, all the princess Mm -hmm. things. What a neat opportunity for her. And now, Tiffany, I know you've introduced yourself here before, but for people maybe tuning in for the first time, can you introduce yourself here now? Yeah. So uh, I am the director of Life Ministry for the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. A deaconess, which means I am a theologically trained woman who serves the Lord and His people. It means it's a, a seminary degree to be certified to be on the roster of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's Commission Ministerium. And I'm married to a pastor, Jonathan Maynard, and we have five children and a granddaughter. I always talk about my granddaughter, but I probably should talk about my my kids a little bit. But, uh, five kids are all pretty much grown up and, and independent and I actually have one at the Disney College program right now, too. So my daughter, Grace, she's right in the, the middle, uh, number 
number three in in the lineup. And she and Holly have been pen pals. Well, mm-hmm. no, I guess texting yeah. pals. <laughs> texting I, okay, so I'm I'm the old one in the room. I'm the grandma in the room right now. <laughs> Are uh, there pen pals texting- still? Are there still pen pals? Yeah, uh, texting buddies, I guess. And um, I don't know if they've actually met in person yet, but they're down in in Orlando. And my granddaughter lives in in Florida too. Oh yeah, with her her parents, right? (laughs) (laughs) I always lead with my granddaughter. Um, (laughs) And uh, she's this cutest thing ever. Yeah, so that's just a little bit about me and my family. She is precious. I've never met her in person, but I do follow your daughter on on social media and she's adorable. She's so sweet. She is. And I'm teaching her all kinds of, of fun things like um, how to play ring around the rosy <laughs> a million times in a row, which her mom seems to love. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to play ring around the rosy all day long. No need to do laundry or cook or anything like that. Let's just play ring around the rosy all day long. <laughs> right. <laughs> so dear listeners, the three of us, uh, we have at least, two things in common. Uh, One, uh, we're very passionate about life ministry and and getting the message out there of our Lord's love and his redemption for human life. And two, of our many vocations gifted to the three of us by our Lord, one of which brings us the greatest joys. And hopefully I'm not overstepping by speaking for you, but also some of the greatest trials. And that is our vocation of motherhood. But with that said, between the three of us, we have very different life experiences, have lived in very different parts of the country, and we have quite different age ranges of children. So Tiffany, working adults, Chris, college-age children, to me, who has a, a baby still growing in the womb. And so we hope that our three voices will add some varying perspectives to what we feel is a very important topic. So ladies, are you ready? Mm-hmm. We are ready. This is this is important to talk about. So um, mm-hmm. I, I hope we have a lot of listeners for this episode because to have grace filled and Christ focused parenting and motherhood is is important. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, a few disclaimers for ourselves and then also our listeners. This episode is is not intended to be a commentary on moms working outside the home versus what you would call stay-at-home moms. The second is this. Our goal is, like Tiffany said, for the gospel to predominate this conversation. Our goal is not to to condemn or to heap more guilt on worn-down moms and, and weary women. To be completely truthful, this episode is is really to address a need that I had personally— and I had shared this with with Tiffany a while back, a, about a year or so ago, I started seeing a slew of articles being published from some major news outlets that, that had me kind of unsettled. And as I read them, I, I was forced to wrestle with my own feelings on motherhood and raising children and then the sacrifices that, that that's meant for me and for my own family. And, and that was good. Because it, it drove me to the scriptures. It set me on a search for books and articles that offered a different perspective. And it led me to seek advice from women and mothers who, who are wiser than myself. And if you'd allow me, I'm just going to read three of the headlines and a few short blurbs from these articles that kind of threw me for a little bit of a loop. And then the three of us will have a, a candid conversation about how these articles might reflect a, a, a new trend in our culture and an even greater shift away from a biblical view of motherhood. Headline number one, and this is from the Huff Post: These moms admit they resent their kids and wish you would too. It's a common feeling and it doesn't make you a bad parent. Headline number two from The Atlantic. The two reasons parents regret having kids. Headline number three from the Washington Post. I sacrificed my career to care for my kids in the pandemic. Never again. So now I'm just going to read some blurbs from these three different articles. Uh, The first, again, from the Huff Post. This lady said, 
Whether it's something as minor as wishing you had more time to yourself and bemoaning how much of you your children need, to more intense feelings of regretting you'd ever had children, these sorts of common feelings are often only talked about in the safety of professional counseling sessions or amongst the closest of friends. A Gallup poll cited in The Atlantic, when American parents older than 45 were asked in a 2013 Gallup poll how many kids they would have if they could do it over, in quotes, approximately 7% said zero. And then here is a woman by the name of Cindy who wrote the last article, I sacrificed my career to care for my kids in the pandemic, never again. She said, and here's her kind of having these internal thoughts, processing them out loud. Ha ha, you think you can have a life of your own? No, your needs will always come second. Don't you know what it means to be a mother? And then she goes on to expound. But if this is what it meant to be a mother, I wanted out. I was tired of sacrificing myself and my career on the altar of motherhood. I wanted a different solution, a way for women to become mothers without losing the right to have a life of their own. And so if I can take the liberty of kind of summing this up, which I would imagine would not be the way that these authors would have summed it up. If it's fair for me to say, these can be summed up under a topic that one might title Mom Resentment. So now I want to talk about it for a couple reasons, but for one, truly, because I had this kind of internal crises <laughs> after reading these, and, and truly, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's like the algorithm of how the internet works and them giving me these news articles that I clicked on once, and so I got more of them. But truthfully, in months' time, I had article after article showing up on my, on my news feed that were very, very similar in echoing the, the same kind of sentiment. So my question for you first is, what are your initial reactions, Tiffany and Chris, to these articles and to the excerpts I read? Do you think that this represents a trend of, of thought in our current culture? Uh, or is this like a small minority of people? What do you think? I'm not sure about the number of people that feel this way, the number of moms. When I heard the word resentment, I thought, oh, this sounds awful. But resentment is an emotion. And I think some of that um, feeling grows out of the chaos of our lives and having anxiety and stress and not staying focused on the most important things in our lives and, and just giving ourselves a break and um, staying focused. Yeah, that that's certainly true. And I, I also was thinking kind of globally about what's the what's the end goal here of these mainstream media? Why why are they wanting to promote this narrative of resentment towards motherhood? And what um what, what value does it bring to them to tear apart this really important vocation? And I don't know, I, I don't really want to speculate on corporate agendas and, and things like that, but but really I see in this the father of all lies, right? You know, it, this is a an element of a spiritual warfare against the family. I mean, this is mm -hmm. Satan really trying to stir things up for people. I mean, it it, it, it bothered you, Steph, reading these articles. It it bothers uh, me. It 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 someone who who might be feeling just a little glimmer of a frustration in a day could read that and feel validated and I'm um, like, yeah, right. I'm not the only one who resents being a mom, resents my children and like fans the flame of that resentment. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when I, I think about, oh, why would they do this? This is not good. I have to kind of step back a minute and say, of course, more, more children born, more faithful moms who um, lead um, and point their children to, to our Lord, to Christ, to Scripture. That is not what Satan wants. He wants to tear apart the family. He wants to tear down and break down moms. He doesn't want more babies in this world. So, kind of, you know, I guess directing my, my own resentment that this is out there in the world in, in the right place. I, re I resent that Satan is trying mm -hmm. to make things even harder in this. But well, I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. We can we can talk about <laughs> Christ having won the, the the battle against Satan. Yeah, but yeah, that certainly makes me wonder. And I was going to add. I know Tiffany and I talked about this um, 
to me, there's just such a devaluation of motherhood and, and yes. so many things you can see in the culture. The language that we use, just how we say, oh, that was before kids. Mm-hmm. You know, it, mm-hmm. we divide our lives often before kids, after kids, and it's definitely damaging. Yeah, I I, I agree. I, I mean, I, I, I do that too. And sometimes it's just how to, to, to break your life into kind of seasons that make sense <laughs> or to bring mm-hmm. order out of something that you can't really bring order out of a life. I see this as... It's kind of being a reflection too. Tiffany, I, I completely agree. I think at the root of this is Satan, the father of lies, attacking what is an institution that we have been given by our father as a reflection of of his love for his people as the family, a father, a mother, and children. I also see coming out of that this cultural trend and movement, which is very, very ugly and very dangerous, that is individualism. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's all about you. Narcissism, kind of, in in a sense. Feminism certainly, I think, has a role in this. The push for gender equality. Um, This whole, these secular ideas of what value is, I feel, is somewhat creeping into Christian culture as well. And it creates confusion of what what is biblical manhood and womanhood, motherhood, uh, confusion about gender roles. The world whispers this to us. And we can just see going down the aisles of of like Barnes and Noble, for instance, and seeing the kind of titles that are there today, even in a religious or Christian section is really not reflective of Christianity at all. And so if we're not paying close enough attention to it, I think we can be seduced by it. So that's why I think it's important to talk about. And now I I guess I kind of want to segue into what have your own experiences been like in mothering? You talked about that you have children, but what does that look like for, for you? In terms of sacrifices you've you've had to make in being a mother, did you work outside of the home? What was your mothering experience or what has it been so far? Well, motherhood is a blessing and um, for me, there's no greater vocation. Um, however, I will say there are obviously motherhood is difficult at times and there are challenges and certainly sacrifices. I stayed at home with my kids. I did work part-time in the evenings when they were younger, and then I went back full-time. And I think the difficulty is just juggling all the responsibilities. Moms are on call 24-7, and you're just bombarded with chores and daily activities. And so I think it's the time constraint. And it's also the guilt when you're working, and uh, even if it's just a few hours a week, you feel like you should be with your kids. Tiffany, what about you? My experience with mothering might have been a little different from both of yours, simply because I I didn't know very much about children, honestly. <laughs> I have, my, my first couple of degrees are in business, and I was the oldest of two. We were close in age. I didn't do a lot of babysitting. I didn't hang around kids a lot when I was, other than, you know, in school, kids my own age. So I didn't know a lot about babies and small children. And, you know, I didn't have some of those child development classes and things that that maybe both of you had. So I went into mothering with really probably some false ideas. Like I was thinking they were much more malleable perhaps than, than what they actually are. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, so, so I, my expectations, um, hit reality really soon. We, we joke, um, our oldest was oh, just the easiest baby. And my husband and I, I don't know, she's a few months old and we're looking at each other and we're like, well, what does everybody complain about? This is pretty easy. We're just, or maybe we're just really good at it. Right. <laughs> and she turned 18 months and uh, started the terrible twos a little early, which I hate that. I hate that phrase, terrible twos. I've loved all the stages mm-hmm. our kids have, have been in and, and now to get to experience them again as a grandma is just delightful. But it just, it, you know, threw me for a loop. It just was not what I was expecting um, because she actually had her own personality and her own will and didn't just, 
you know, do as we thought. And then number two came along and he was a completely different baby from, from number one and um, colicky and cried. And we're like, whoa, this is this. Okay. Now we understand this can be a little hard. Um, so I, I had, I had that of, of um, some idealized expectation and thought how things would, would go. And, and then realized that life is a little bit messy and it, and, and my five-year plan, <laughs> Because I thought um, some of the concepts I learned in business school could ap- apply to the family. And I, just <laughs> things out. I know, I know. You, I, we laugh, but um, I, I really, I thought it was true. I thought it was real, um, but but now um, my husband and I laugh too. And 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 so yes, we we did have to make sacrifices, and it wasn't always easy. But I mean, would I trade it for anything? No, not not at all. Because the greatest joys and blessings, and, and we've had we've had some really difficult things. You know, we had um, our, our child almost die um, as an infant, you know, had miscarriage, I mean, serious illnesses, um, mental health challenges, m- a lot of moves for my husband to attend seminary and vicarage and, and parishes. So it's it's not been easy and we have had to sacrifice. But I, I think that that's really important stuff. You were talking about some of these other um, challenges to um, vocations in the family, in our, our culture. And I it comes back to this, this individualism and this this putting self before others, and and really doesn't in, in some places that that puts us trying to be God. It takes me back to the Garden of Eden, right? Trying to yeah. to be in the place of God. Um, that was that was where sin came into this world for Adam and Eve, yeah. and we continue we continue that even now, where we this this original sin in us that once ourselves to be first and we don't like to have to make those sacrifices we don't want to live lives of servanthood in our in our original sin that old adam in us and so you know christ sacrificed everything for us we cannot possibly match his level of sacrifice so any any sacrifice that we make for our children for our spouses for other people other people in our lives it it is really important that we we keep that in perspective that that the Christian life is one of serving others and and sacrificing for them. We we don't actually come first. Yeah. We don't actually come first and that is very counter cultural. Mhm. Often oh, my husband's so good at this. Often he reminds us uh, this comes down to like a uh, daily habits, practices even stuff that, you know, we, too, the major things we we see in culture. He's very good at, at pointing these things out and saying, this is what we've been doing. But is this scriptural? Is it biblical? Is it what Christ would have us do? And very few times, due to the fact that families are very busy, life is very chaotic, life is very fast-paced, we don't take time to stop and think and to assess, is this, is this how God would have it? Or am I following this cultural flow and trend? I think it's very wise to step back and to, to look at that. And so that's partly what we're doing today. And if I may, I'm just going to share a little bit about my own experience. And I'm the most uninteresting person of the three of us. I also had no child development classes. I, very much like Tiffany, was very surprised by the many loops that kids would throw you for, (laughs) that children brought this whole new level of uncertainty and uh, not knowing what would come next. I, my oldest is five. We have a three-year-old girl and we're expecting our third child. And my husband was finishing up seminary as we were expecting our son. And from the time I graduated college to then giving birth to Judah, our oldest, I worked a full time and I loved work. I loved my job. I had different jobs and careers throughout that time and I I love them all. (laughs) And then when Judah came along, I had said, I'm going to take some time and be with him full time at home. And so I was still working very hard (laughs) in the home. I just didn't have a career outside of the home. But that actually wasn't as big of an adjustment to me as I thought it would be. (laughs) And like you, Tiffany, our first child, he was awesome. 
I thought the same thing. I remember having those exact same feelings. What is everyone talking about? He's so easy. This is great. I I remember being like at, at five months, I'm like, I want all the kids. I want 20 of these. And I, I still think I would take 20 Judas because <laughs> he's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Nora is awesome too. He grew into his twos and threes and it was very different uh, than his very sweet infancy. And Nora... Uh, is a very different, unique personality. And she, I, I joke, but I also with some truth that she takes about 99% of my parenting energy. She just requires more. Uh, and so that's where we are right now, me and my family in our parenting journey. So we're very, very young in all of this. And I appreciate your two perspectives because there's a lot I don't know yet and a lot I haven't lived yet. So thank you for talking about this with me, because when I referred to the wiser and more experienced women and moms, I also mean you too. Now that we kind of know where we're all coming from, at least in our mothering journey so far, back to these articles. If this is still a, a minority opinion of mothers or even parents in general, Tiffany, you kind of hit on this a little bit already, but what do you think the dangers might be in being exposed to these kind of articles or reading these articles without giving them much thought? How might reading these articles plant ideas in parents' heads or moms' heads that they may not have otherwise thought about before? Yeah, Steph, you've, you've said it. it. We have sometimes this audio track that plays in our heads, right? It could be self-talk. It can be other things that we've encountered throughout our, our day and people and things we've we've read. And we can start to perseverate on that. And it, it can can be um, wholesome. It, it can be not so wholesome and, and actually even destructive to our Christian worldview and, and understanding of, of life looked through the, the lens of, of Christ. And so these types of, of articles, I, I don't think it's overstating it to say it's, it's dangerous. It, it's actually really, really dangerous. Sure, if you, you see the headline, you can, you can uh, reframe those, take the perspective of, that's not true. We'll acknowledge that mothering, parenting is hard, but, but the way those headlines read, that, that is not the true view of motherhood. That is not what scripture says about being a, a mom and being a wife. And we can set those aside. So, th so that can can be a choice when we encounter these types of things, but then also we we can set a a different narrative for for ourselves, for the people in our congregations, the the parents in our, our schools, to lift up motherhood and, and familyhood. And, and maybe I'm getting a little too far ahead of this, but we need to we need to understand parenting and motherhood through the Bible. And and that for me was was really tricky. I described, you know, in, in my parenting, you know, kind of encapsulated really, th um, we're at three decades now of, of parenting and encapsulated that all very, very quickly. But, but part of my issue as a young Christian mom was that I had not been raised in the church. I didn't know what a Christian mom was like. So I actually was taught how to be a Lutheran Christian mom by the other women in my church, by our LWML, Lutheran Women's Missionary League, uh, women that I was around that were a few stages ahead of me, and uh, women in in Bible study and families that I saw in church where I thought, you know what, I want to be like that mom. Yeah. And so, I think that's that's kind of the opportunity to combat those the, those dangerous ideas and to to replace and reframe in our minds um, how there can be difficulty in motherhood, but this is how how you get through it with with grace and with your eyes on Christ. And and to be focused on on that, I don't know. I, I I'm looking at Ephesians four two right now and thinking about this, framing up motherhood not as as something to resent, but instead humility, gentleness, patience, and loving. You know, and and Ephesians four two talks about bearing with one another in love. That's what we need to have in front of us as as far as motherhood. Yeah, and I think again it goes back to the devaluation of motherhood and um, maybe of life in general. We need to. Um, uplift moms and they're carrying children for nine months in the womb and they're um, they're making sacrifices and they're um, giving up full-time careers to be at home at times and um, 
they're juggling everything. And when you think about motherhood and all the roles that a, that a mother has, nurturer, spiritual advisor, physician, nurse, chef, <laughs> activities coordinator. <laughs> Shall I go on? <laughs> chauffeur. <laughs> yeah, chauffeur. Feeling, feeling tired again. I really appreciate both of of those points. And I, you know, after taking some time to reflect about the articles that I read, after talking to my husband, reading through scripture, reading kind of, you know, an alternative to this, you realize that, you know, you can't be too hard on <laughs> these authors, because I would presume, maybe this is over presuming, I would presume they're not Christians or they don't know the kind of gift language that the church uses in terms of parenting, motherhood, children. And so we could expect this kind of language from our culture because it's not the church. But the church should be recognizing this and continuing to declare the beautiful message of the gospel and how our Lord redeems these vocations to serve his purposes and ultimately offer a much more freeing and more beautiful story for us, for parents in general, for the people of God at large. And so in reading these, you know, You can see, okay, this is a lie that I'm reading. And so to also answer my own question, you know, how could these ideas plant ideas in in mom's heads they they didn't otherwise consider? (laughs) We will presumably pick up the narrative that culture is wanting us to believe rather than the narrative that is true, faithful, and caught up in Christ, unless we recognize them as lies and are able to then articulate the truth to ourselves and then to other moms. Uh, So what we're doing here today is we're identifying what it is the secular world is teaching about this and that it's destructive in a way of thinking about motherhood. And instead, hoping to encourage moms, wives, the family to live lives that are faithful to what we actually believe. I think that's Absolutely right. And I and I think there's something else too. We have a place to take our resentment that people who aren't in Christ don't don't know about yet until they, they come to know our Lord and his word. But um with when these inevitable resentments and frustrations come up, we confess them, right? And we're forgiven, we're absolved, and then um through the word and sacrament strengthened to go out and and live in a, a, a joyful way of motherhood. Now, now not joy like it, it's all pure happiness, but mm-hmm. that that joy of, of being in Christ and and ordering our lives around Him, around the Word, and that that's a, a place that we can instead of having to take our resentment to articles and newspapers or blog posts and social media um, dogpiling, where you mm-hmm. kind of just keep. Uh, and talking about how resentful you are, you become more resentful because mm-hmm. other people say how resentful they are. No, we, we take it directly to our Lord. Whether that's in a, a corporate confession on a Sunday morning in, in the middle of you know a divine service where we are making confession to our Lord, or to the, the blessing that we have that we probably don't take advantage of enough of, of a one-on-one confession to our, our pastor. We can go as an individual confession and, and really like lay it out um, before God out loud into the ears of, of a, a man who has, has promised um, not to divulge them, where he can then convey the forgiveness of our Lord directly and personally for those particular sins that we confess individually and be absolved. It's so freeing. It's so mm-hmm. lovely. And and I think about how much I, I would want that for these others, these, these authors and contributors to the articles, the people they're quoting, that 7% of people in that study. I, in, in some ways, it's it's really compelling um, for our our witness to the the world that more people could be in Christ and and have the opportunity to to be absolved and you know to confess and be absolved of their resentment and and not take it to other places where it's not going to have a, a true resolution and, and reconciliation. 
Yeah. Oh, that. thank you. Tiffany, you, uh, maybe it's that we've worked together for a little bit, so you can kind of anticipate <laughs> where I'm going. <laughs> you, you answered my my next question, really, in a beautiful way, offering the gospel to women who feel this way, including even Christian women. I will be completely honest in that I have not always counted it as pure joy <laughs> to experience the sufferings, the sacrifice of motherhood. And so I don't, I certainly don't want to make moms who are listening feel as though they are not living the Christian life if these feelings have come into their minds and have somehow rooted in their hearts. But Tiffany, you have offered a way to deal with that. And as Chris had identified at the very beginning, resentment is an emotion. And how do you deal with resentment? Well, you focus on what is true, for one. And then Tiffany, you had also said, how do you deal with resentment? (laughs) Uh, You go to our Lord in confession and you receive his good message of forgiveness of sins and urge to go on and live freely in the way that that he has us do. I also see these feelings not only being isolated to the secular realm because as part of the curse (laughs) in Genesis, we know that there's going to be a part of women that look at the headship of men That could even include what opportunities they get to do or the gifts they have been given. And women will, because of the curse, want to usurp that, will want to do that role that men do. And that is a whole other conversation. But to recognize also that at times some of these feelings may actually be a true representation of what our Lord has already warned us of at the beginning of time due to sin. Also realizing that this resentment that has been portrayed in these articles that I read uh, may also be considered a form of self-pity, perhaps. And self-pity itself is antithetical to the life of a Christian. And so knowing all of these things and taking them to our Lord, uh, taking them to a pastor in private confession and absolution, a pastor who speaks in the stead and by the command for giving our sins on behalf of Christ's word, it's a very powerful thing. Thank you for that reminder. So far, we've kind of talked <laughs> the dangerous, the, the bad, and I feel I've been a little bit of a, of a naysayer here. And so... Taking the advice of a dear Dr. John Kleinig, who I have learned from and who's been on this show, Christians have the opportunity to light a candle in the darkness. And so we offer a different way. Let's talk about what that different way is. Let's talk about what scripture says about the vocation of parent and how does our faith inform us about what it is to be a mother? I think a lot of times people uh, go to the fourth commandment when they're talking about motherhood. And that's really about honoring your your parents. And and it's more of the the response of of the the child to the parent. But I think there's a, a great deal that we can learn there about authority. And when you become a parent and you're an authority to your children, it's, um, it's an honor. It's a privilege. We approach it in that way. And, and sacrifice required as part of that, and so there's other there's other passages as as well that we can we can think about and and focus on instead of some of these ideas of, of resentment. And I mentioned those earlier, but you know, in, in the New Testament, there's there's passages about about women. Titus chapter two that the older women would be taught to be reverent. And the way they live, not to be slanders or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. These are, uh, of course, some ideas about how um, Christian women can mentor one another and, and teach one another to be, to be wives and, and mothers. It's law. Just, you know, say that straight up front. It, it, it's it's something that we as 
as people as humans have to do uh, to understand um, what is law in the Bible and what is gospel in the Bible. You you look to the verbs. Who's doing the thing? If if it's people doing it, well then it's law. But in this case, a, a third use of the law. How is this a guide for godly motherhood and and life? And and we have to remember in order to to do this where. Where do we get the strength to do it from? And that's the gospel. That's where God is is working. And um, so when God's doing the verbs, um, so when God not only gives us the gift of and a privilege and honor of being a mother, that that's a gift from Him. He's the one who who makes our children, knits them together in, in our wombs as mothers, or knits them in the womb of another mother, who then you know we might a- adopt or foster um, as a child. But God strengthens us to do that work and enables us to do that work. So we can certainly look to those the scriptures, but again, keep in mind that those passages about motherhood are not a checklist for us. Um, sometimes uh, Proverbs 31 gets looked at like that, like to, to be the godly wife and mother, you you do all of those things in Proverbs 31. That That's not what those Proverbs 31 is. It's a, <laughs> meant to be. And, and so again, if we don't create some standard that we can't live up to by by using this and, and then maybe beating ourselves up with it. But again, to to turn back to, to God and ask for Him to strengthen us to, to mother and to be the, the mother that He created us to be. He, he, he did not bring our children into our families on accident. It was, it was on purpose. He gave those specific children to that specific and particular mom. And then He enables her, me, you, to, to be the mom that they need really through his, his word and his sacrament that we're strengthened because we're in Christ to, to do that what he puts before us. So that's that's the the you know the tension there is that we we don't use scripture as some type of standard for, for motherhood because we'll we'll never be able to keep the law perfectly. And so it's it's the gospel that that fills us and enables us to do that. I would say, you know, as a mother, keep in mind that Christ walks along with us every step of the way. And knows all of our faults and our shortfalls and um, throughout the difficulties of parenting, you know, sometimes you feel like you're you're not doing enough or you should have done this or that and stay focused on the cross and Christ's sacrifice and um, he walks with us. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God, yeah. God with us. Those days when <laughs> I remember my son um, deciding to destroy the kitchen. And mm. it just felt too much. God's there in the midst mm-hmm. of that too. Or mm-hmm. when they're being so sassy and you think, oh, how can they speak like this to me? And mm-hmm. um, Christ is, is there, there too, uh, bearing even those burdens. Mm-hmm. He's in the midst of it with us. Yes. I appreciate what you pointed out, Tiffany, because as I was looking for verses on mothering and parenthood, I found fewer than I was hoping. And, you know, that's the problem with with me wanting, you know, scripture to use the verbiage that I do in my modern day, I suppose. But it does talk in a lot of generals about how people are to live toward one another. And certainly it talks about parents and children. And one of my favorite pointed out to me by my dear friend Katie Shurman is this, and we have a specific episode about gift language. Psalm 127 says, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. And ultimately what this says, and as Katie has so kindly reminded me, is that if we have been given children, there's the the key verb, we've been given. <laughs> God is the giver, and then therefore children are a gift. And so we should move forward with that language, always in our minds. And it doesn't mean that gifts don't come without responsibilities or sacrifices or challenges by, by no means, but that should be front and center. These, these little children, these college-age kids, these adult children now giving me grandchildren gifts, primarily gifts. And Proverbs also talks about Uh, the role of parents being in to train up a child in the way that they should go. So parents have that command and the authority given to them by God to train, to raise, to disciple, 
as you would to discipline their children and to teach them the fear of the Lord. Luther, surprisingly, expounds, not surprisingly, I don't know why I I would say that, but him being a guy growing up in the context that he did really kind of revolutionized for the time what it meant for the church to see the family and that the family was a place where spiritual work also happened. It wasn't just the priesthood. It wasn't just in being a nun. He reminded the church of the value that is being a parent, being a mother. And this is what he says. This is from Luther's works. So the man wrote many a many thing. And in one of his works, he says, God grants offspring and commands that they be brought up to worship and serve him. In all the world, this is the noblest and most precious work because to God, there can be nothing dearer than the salvation of souls. Most certainly, father and mother are apostles, bishops, and priests to their children, for it is they who make them acquainted with the gospel. In short, there is no greater or nobler authority on earth than that of parents over their children, for this authority is both spiritual and temporal. And then he even says in a separate uh, Luther's work. Oh, I'm sorry. This is actually part of the, the same section he talks about parents. He says, what does Christian faith say about this, about parenting? It opens its eyes, looks upon all these insignificant, distasteful, and despised duties in the spirit, and is aware that they are all adorned with divine approval as with the costliest gold and jewels. I just, I love Luther. I think he's so wonderful to read and so comforting too. Motherhood is a noble work and it is adorned like the head of someone adorned with costly gold and jewels. I love that. And I think that because of the society that we live in too many times, we devalue that. And, you know, how many times do we say, oh, what do you do? And people don't say, oh, I'm a mother. They'll say, I'm a physician or I'm a nurse, and we're, we're mothers by vocation. My, one of my daughters was little, and people would ask her, what do you want to be? What do you want to mm-hmm. do when you grow up? And she would say, I want to be a mommy. Mm-hmm. And they would say, what else? And I, and I would you know, no, that doesn't have to be anything else. She wants to be a mommy. That's a really noble thing to want to be. Yes. Yes. Yep. My three-year-old has actually also said that, too. She said a lot of other things, but in, in some <laughs> instances— that's what she says. And I said, I would love that. <laughs> I would love if you would be a mommy and if God would give that to you. If if listeners here are looking for other places besides good old Luther or the scriptures to, to study and refresh their minds on this, I would also point to Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together. In his book, he talks about what it is to be placed within a family what it is to be placed within a church, what it is to be placed within a community. And he talks about how it's all about service, how it's all about love for the neighbor, and how Christ gives us the very perspective on all of these things. It's a beautiful reference. It doesn't necessarily talk a lot about parenting, but it's a great way to remind (laughs) and refresh our minds about what it is to to live with others around us and and to serve our neighbor that we've been given. Bringing up Bonhoeffer and life together in that community is really important when it comes to supporting one another in, in motherhood and in parenthood. And it can, it can go a couple of different ways. And I'm going to start with the way it's not so edifying. <laughs> and that's, um, I, I mentioned the phrase dog piling a little while ago, and I think I use it in the context of, of social media, but it can happen in other ways. If we get together, and sometimes people will refer to it as venting, like I just want to vent about being a mom and we get together with our moms and we're just kind of complaining about things. That's not going to be a very edifying community. But if we can be a community and we can support one another in our vocations of of mothers and um, reflect Christ, point one another to to the Word, to to Christ and His promises for us, and and, um, through that, 
share the gospel with one another, that can really be helpful in mothering. I'm, I'm thinking of when I was a young mom, the community I found in, in my church and the women who walked alongside me taught me how to be a mom, but um, also were, were bearing the burdens with me. Having mom's group and getting together with other moms to, to go through these seasons of life together, that can all really really be helpful. As the body of Christ, we're, we're meant to be in community and in relationship with one another. And to be isolated as a mom can cause these doubts and resentments to grow. Because again, Satan uses that tactic in, in this battle he's waging uh, against us. I mean, the war is, he's lost, but he's, he's trying to take down others with him. Mm-hmm. And he wants us separated and isolated and not talking to one another. And so if we are in community in our own families, you know, and with our children and serving them, but serving one another, mom to mom, uh, dad, other dad to mom and Christian friends and all generations in, in our congregations and our churches and our communities, that is, is really going to help get through some of these challenging times mm-hmm. and, and to bear burdens and, and, and again, to point to one another that, to that source, which is, is truly helpful, which is, is Christ and his word. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you couple other genius people, uh, C.S. Lewis, of course, in his book, The Weight of Glory, he talks about, you have never talked to a mere mortal. Next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. And what he's saying there is that no person we are called to care for is a mere mortal. They are immortal beings that will last into eternity. And so our interaction with them is not temporal. Therefore, our children, being some of our nearest neighbors, are those we are called to serve. And they are not mere mortals. They will go on into eternity. And I think Luther obviously recognizes this and the fact that this is a a noble and precious work is that these kids are learning the faith and being taught the faith and baptized into the faith and they will live forever. And so the impact that our parenting through God's strength and the gospel has on them is forever. I read a book by Lisa Jo Baker called Surprised by Motherhood. And she said, the beauty of motherhood is that it's a mix of both the mundane and the eternal. The small directly correlated to the massive And then this is my favorite line. Kids walking around like so much eternity with skin on. My little children walking around who will be with Jesus forever. That gives new meaning to what I do with them on a daily basis. Every moment matters. Yes. And so there's God's grace when we uh, sin against them, when when we mess up. And there's God's strength to help us, especially in times of difficulty in motherhood. Finally, as as we draw to a a close here, I really want to be able to end on a high point of the gospel. Where is the gospel for mothers? Where is all the grace and the sacrifice, in the joy, in the trials? And I guess ultimately, how can we ease a mother's conscience and encourage them also to be faithful? Well, I think we stay focused on the cross. We as mothers know how difficult our vocation is. We stay focused in prayer and we lift each other up and we walk with each other and support each other. The gospel is always found in Christ. And he has... Uh, removed our sins from us as far as um, the east is from the west. Um, God has has removed our sin. And so we know that he has grace and mercy and abundance for us. We get to receive that in our parenting. We have the opportunity. Boy, boy, parenting has given me a a prayer life like (laughs) I never had before. And a, a lot of opportunities to confess too because I sin, but it's also given an opportunity for my children to understand what confession and forgiveness is because I get to 
confess to them the times I mess up and they get to forgive me and they get to see me live in that forgiveness that I receive from them and for, but more importantly from our Lord. And so it, it is a blessing to live our lives in the church, to have that, that rhythm of going, the, the burdens that we pick up each day, that we, we take um, to our Lord, we go to our house, His house every Sunday, forgiven by Him, strengthened in the sacrament, to go back out and, and to do it all over again, and, and this time lighter, a little maybe wiser, um, more reflective of our Lord in, in our life, embodying embodying Him who saved us in our, our baptism and then dwell in us to serve the people around us. So we're, we're these, um, in our, our mother, we're these masks of God, um, mm-hmm. His love conveyed to others through us um, that, that we do in that strength that He um, provides us. So it's, you know, sacrificing self so that, that Christ can be predominant in our, all of our relationships and in, in our mothering as well. I like that, Tiffany. Masks of God. Very Lutheran of you. Yeah, I didn't exactly think that up on my own. (laughs) Yeah, it's directly from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther. (laughs) Yeah, Luther Luther coined that phrase, and it's genius in in terms of uh, our vocations being masks of God and a means by which we serve our neighbor. My hope in this episode is uh, so that you know, we, we say that we are um, building a community around our love for the Lord and His love for life. And my hope would be that we offer support to one another, to mothers specifically, to find contentment and joy in the vocations that God has given us, even when that means that there are challenges. And ultimately, we learn from Scripture that we don't, in any of our vocations, demand appreciation for our work. That is what agape love is. It's living with no expectation of any kind of reward or or gratification. It is a selfless love. And that means we look to Jesus. He is that selfless love. 1 Corinthians 13, an often quoted verse, but gets passed over too quickly. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And who is that love? It's Jesus Christ. And so we look to him for refreshment, for strength, for forgiveness. And that love may may be embodied in in us as well. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tiffany. And thank you, Chris, so much for joining me today. It's been great to talk about this. Thanks for having us. And thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And don't forget to click the follow or subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. New episodes drop twice each month. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that introduces listeners to life issues by introducing them to friends who stand for life. Thank you.